The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome everybody to this webinar organized by uh, the ICAMI Safety Center jointly with uh, DECRA, who is our uh, member company to the ICAMI Safety Center. I'm pretty sure that you will be really interested in today's topic as today marks the 36th anniversary of the tragic Chernobyl uh, accident that occurred in 1986. And we will see today's presentation by Paulo Oliveira, uh, who is the director uh, of consulting by DECRA, uh, whether or what could PSM or process safety management, uh, whether it could have prevented the catastrophe. I'm pretty sure it will be a really interesting presentation. And with that, uh, Soon, I will give the floor to Paolo. I just want to uh, let you know about some logistics. This webinar will be, and it is indeed recorded, and the recording will be uploaded to different uh, platforms that we use by the ICAMI Safety Center, such as uh, the YouTube channel, LinkedIn, and uh, our website as well. So if you don't have the chance to um, to watch this webinar or you want to share it later on with your colleagues or peers, then please feel free to do so. Also, I would like um, to let you know that you can uh, ask questions uh, throughout the webinar, which will be answered in the end of the presentation. Please use the questions box, as you can see on your screen. So thank you. And uh, Paolo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Susanna. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Paulo Oliveira, as uh, Susanna introduced me. I am um, the Director of Consulting for DECRA Organizational and Process Safety. I've joined recently. Um, just as a, a very brief introduction to, to myself, um, my background is, uh, I'm not a chemical engineer. That's probably a good start to uh, to take you through the journey of my career. Um, I actually have uh, a degree in electrical and electronics engineering and a master's degree in process safety, which seems to be a, an odd combination. Um, I have about 13, 14 years experience in the manufacturing side, um, where I spent most of those uh, years in a um, high hazard fa facility um, just in the Humberside region, uh, come a top tier site where uh, process safety was um, was a, a big part of everything I did and it really, really um, appealed to me and I, I got involved with it quite intensely. Um, I've had roles in projects, maintenance, operations and process safety um, as well as, as a focus on uh, asset-based um, criticality, mostly to do with um, safety critical equipment and broader asset management. Um, the last eight and a half to nine years I spent in consulting with a focus on that asset-based system safety uh, where I advised organizations on technical safety um, with regards to uh, their ability to not only meet regulatory requirements but in fact operate safely, continue safe operations or uh, advise on improvements uh, post near misses and incidents um, as part of investigations. Um, I, I have a, a quite a, a lot of um, areas of uh, process safety that I'm very interested in. Um, I'm particularly interested on system safety and the interaction it has with people. And I'm currently um, involved in a number of activities with national and international committees, as well as chairing uh, the system safety uh, technical network for the Institute of Engineering and Technology. So it's just to give you a little bit of a, uh, a broad view of who I am and why am I here today talking to you about uh, process safety management and how that does that link with the Chern Chernobyl catastrophe that uh, has its anniversary today. Um, so Today's um, journey um, is going to take us through a, a few topics and a few concepts. And um, we're, we're going to start at, um, right at the start, well, how do we actually implement a process safety management system? Fairly high level, but it, it sets the scene. Um, 
I'm, I'm quite um, quite keen to keep the the whole presentation um, at a level that it can easily be um, debated and discussed. And in some cases, we will get into to more detail. Um, the presentation will provide a, a fairly high level review of PSM, and it will frame the topic um, with um, the the case study for for Chernobyl to to give us. Uh, an understanding of how that could have impacted a good process safety system. How could have, that have impacted the outcome from Chernobyl? Again, at high level, because there's a lot of detail um, on the, the Chernobyl incident that we, it would take us a lot longer than just uh, the, the duration of this webinar to, to cover, but it should, should give for a, a good debate. Um, this is a, this is a topic that's, quite uh, close to my heart not not necessarily the the management system itself but the the real life application of the management system and how we actually see a management system versus um how it actually affects people on the ground so we're going to talk a little bit about maturity and how does that kind of fit into the idea of a process safety management system and then we will contextualize it within the case study to to help us draw some some fairly um, uh, interesting conclusions and see how we uh, how we can actually answer the question would it have prevented it or at least made it a lot harder to to have happened so if you're all ready and um, keen to to move on we shall get started. So how is a process safety system uh, implemented? As any management system, um, regardless of its intent, the, the intention is to have a set of structured approaches, methodologies and um, procedures that are um, actionable during the, the operation of a site or an organization and with a defined benefit. And that defined benefit is key to understand why that management system needs to understand, needs to be in place um, and needs to continuously understand how the organization actually makes use and takes value out of its presence. In most cases, the process is the same. We could extract this from a quality management system um, a training course or for a uh, asset management system training course, the steps tend, tend to be the same. Um, you tend to look at your current performance level within the context that you're discussing. You then intervene in the areas where you need to improve or you need to, to focus to make um, that performance meet your, your desired level of um, performance. And then you monitor that those actions are properly implemented and then delivering the, the value. And then you start again. So nothing new there, that, uh, that loop is um, very well known and uh, I'm sure it won't be new to the majority, if not all of you. But the interesting thing about process safety is that um, process safety is such a complex um, topic with so many things that interface with each other and with the management system itself that this is not as straightforward as it could be or as we wish it would be. A uh, process safety system can take so many shapes and colors um, if you take into account the, the current guidance that exists around the world so you have the wildly wi sorry widely um, known um, CCPS model, um, which a lot of companies and organizations and indeed ourselves at DECRA use as one of the benchmarks for process safety management. You also have um, more recent um, guidance like the Energy Institute uh, process safety management framework. And for the UK, for example, you have the, the health and safety executive guidance, HSG 254, and just as an example of the, the information that's out there. Um, API has some, some guidance in the US, the 754 series, 
um, where it, it kind of gives you um, some some um, well known and well trialed and tested methodologies and approaches to how to manage process safety in specific contexts. But there's a hell of a lot of information and guidance out there. Um, and they all focus on providing a level of um, insight to the person picking up that guidance and using it. They um, they give you a almost like a roadmap to how to comply with certain requirements. And at this point, I'd like to leave a question for the, the audience. Uh, which it's uh, obviously a uh, hypothetical question that I'm hoping we will uh, will answer later on. Do we think that the models that are currently available out there, the, the CCPS, the Energy Institute, even the, the regulatory model that is used in the UK or US, they seem to focus on compliance to technical standards. So you'll hear um, direct mentions to API standards, to IEC standards, to ISO standards, and then use those standards to drive that assessment process. Is this enough? The question here is, is this enough? Is compliance to a technical standard enough? This, in our view, played a significant role in uh, a lot of major accident hazards um, that we've seen around the world and certainly uh, on the case study we're going to discuss today. On top of this, to, to add to the complexity, because you know it's not complex enough just to look at the technical requirements, each country will have regulatory requirements and geopolitical conditions that will define a context to how that guidance can and should be applied. And in the UK, um, we have COMA, uh, Control of Major Accident Hazards, which is a, a direct um, extraction or um, sister directive from the Cerveso Directive in Europe. And in the US, you have the OSHA requirements um, defined in uh, guidance or regulation 1910.119. Question number two here is these um, regulatory compliance models are very often very broad based and vague on what the expectations are in the operators, which tends to put us engineers uh, and um, technical safety people in a, a bit, little bit of a situation where we will default to what's in the guidance, in the um, available uh, documentation and published um, research with regards to how to comply and implement the process safety management. And it takes us back to that first question of, is technical compliance enough to say that the process safety management system is effective? And common to all this is that loop that we started this uh, discussion with, which is that continuous improvement loop, which raises another question in real life, where does that loop end? So if we look at um, how we actually define and implement that system, how we go through that loop, does it actually happen as we expected throughout all the life, life cycle stages of a, a system or a site or an organization? Or does it tend to be shortened to the points where we can draw a line, so feed stages or uh, design stages or construction stages. Is it a holistic journey or is it a piecemeal? And again, is it enough? All these questions exist um, and are frequently debated by not only operators but regulators and technical experts on how can we actually move from um, a, a situation where we're maybe looking at isolated aspects of compliance to a more realistic view of how well we're actually managing the, the process safety requirements on the site or organization. Here at DECRA, we, we truly believe that 
the, the quest for excellence, it's never ending journey and a thrilling one. We, we do get excited with the, the challenges that we, um, we face when we, we advise and support uh, colleagues, clients, or professional uh, organizations like the IKME and IET with some of these challenges. But it, it reflects a, a mindset that has been developed over a number of years um, in collaboration with all these, um, all these institutions and organizations where we truly believe that we can't, um, we can't kind of draw a line to say this is the end road, and this is the end game. Uh, that end game continues to, to move and evolve and we have to evolve with it. And we have to be able to challenge what we feel has worked well in the past um, and what maybe the next steps are. Maybe some ideas that we were uncomfortable with 10 years ago, 15 years ago, are now becoming more um, not only appealing but actually feasible due to advances not only in technology but knowledge as well. So how do we start that, uh, that quest? Um, for excellence, what where, where are those first steps and how do we actually make it work for us? So let's, let's have a look at traditional auditing. Um, I'm sure that uh, most, if not all of the people in the, in the call, in one way or another, have had the experience of being either at the receiving end of an audit, it was process safety, quality, um, any, um, or you've been actually delivering those audits to a colleague uh, organization uh, within your organization to clients. With that experience, um, typically what you're trying to do is create a line of sight between the documented uh, practices and the actual practices. And my experience when conducting audits, which were always fantastic learning exercises, both for myself and for, for the organization, both when I was in manufacturing and now in consulting, what I found was um, there, there's a little bit of a tunnel vision that develops when you're doing an audit uh, because you are focusing on what the audit is trying to establish. So, for example, if we are doing a process safety management audit and we are auditing uh, mechanical integrity, your mindset becomes about mechanical integrity and what is happening in the field of mechanical integrity within that organization. So, you dig deeper, you get the answers, you identify the gaps, and then you come out and you identify the improvement actions where necessary within that sphere. So mechanical integrity is covered. Tick on the box, we move on to the next subject. The problem with that, of course, is process safety doesn't deal with isolated um, aspects. We, we all understand um, very well, or at least have been exposed to the, the principle of barrier thinking, where we need a number of barriers to be effective, which means there's a number of requirements that need to concurrently um, be satisfied, which means that there is a, a bigger picture than the one delivered by isolated um, disciplines and aspects of process safety. So traditional auditing ends up becoming a little bit static. Um, single snapshot in time um, with an action that's tied to that tunnel that we've navigated. Um, it does end up becoming a validation or should I say a verification that the procedure is being done rather than is the practice right. Um, as an example, um, a couple of audits that are participated um, utilizing some of the, the pre-defined audit tools that exist out there. Some of them divide, uh, defined by our, our clients, some of them actual um, guidance that exists from regulators around the world. Um, we end up having that conversation with the client about does this actually happen to try and prove that the procedure is correct 
and is good enough to do its job rather than understanding if the practice fits what we want as part of the process safety management system. Also, the nature of those predefined elements, as I mentioned earlier, they're usually focusing on agreed isolated metrics. So is mechanical integrity compliance? So is the technical compliance aspect of that element being satisfied? But there is very little crossover to how does that impact the other metrics? How does that impact the other elements? And what is it that we're seeing that could actually have a knock-on effect to defeat that barrier thinking that PSM tries to bring to, to, to fruition? So it doesn't really get to the crux of is an organization developing capability in process safety and is its culture driving that capability in the right direction to keep that barrier um, approach as healthy as possible to keep the organization operating within its uh, level of accepted or tolerable uh, risk. It is a key to understand that capability because ultimately the relationship between capability and culture is the ability of an organization to um, actually implement a effective risk management program together. And our experience is that's usually overlooked when looking at process safety management. There is a, a bias to the technical stuff, the stuff we're comfortable. Um, just as a, as a note, we define organizational capability as knowledge, experience, data, skills, and tools needed to support a process safety program. And we define organizational culture as the underlying unstated shared practices, beliefs, and values that exist within an organization. So when, when looking at this, what we're talking about is the maturity of that organization with regards to process safety delivery, its efficiency, and how we capture those subtleties that can have a major knock-on effect on the ability to um, implement process safety, um, not just management, but approaches. This has been recognized around the world by regulators that actually it's such a broad topic. It's very easy to get into the tunnel and think everything's okay within that tunnel, but not actually see the little um, doorways that connect all different tunnels. So the only way to truly understand if a site or an organization is managing its process safety is to understand um, the reality of how these things come together in the field and in the overall sphere of managing those requirements. I know what you guys are thinking. You're just talking about a different type of audit. It truly isn't. We're talking about actually articulating more than one aspect of process safety and understanding its um, by maybe even tri-dimensional impact on an organization, uh, not just, just decision making, but also operational capability. So what does that mean? Well, can we do it? Well, quoting Carl Jung, maybe this is part of that journey, that quest for excellence, where we start challenging the way we look at how we've been doing things and how we actually need to do them going forward. We, we are what we do. And um, you probably heard the, the whole uh, conversation around culture is the way we do things around here. So having procedures, having action lists, et cetera, is great, but what's actually happening and how, how do those procedures and action lists actually fit into the practice rather than the other way around is key. So we need to take a step. We need to take a step forward um, and start looking at 
what is it that we're trying to achieve rather than how well are we doing what we're doing now? Um, someone said that if we limit ourselves to looking at where we are in order to determine if we're there, then we're always going to we're always going to believe that we've, we've basically reached the destination. We, we're doing it. The difficulty will persist on how to define that journey, that quest for excellence. And it's not a new challenge. Um, to actually quantify or define how far we are from where we want to be or where we should be and are we going in the right direction, understanding a little bit of how um, how that um, that journey, that, that impact, where, where, are we hitting a, a hot spot of activity and PSM becoming a hot topic or is it just something else that's disappearing in the background? Um, how do we do that? And the the truth is, without clear um, metrics, without clear models, it's hard. Not impossible, but it's hard because each person, each group, each organization, or even each country will have a view of where is it that we want to, to go to. If you think about this, this is not a new challenge though. Occupational health have has a history of going through exactly the same challenge, trying to understand how to help an organization fully embed um, safety principles in the way they do um, everything in their operations, in their uh, management structures, in their um, business processes. And in the 90s, um, specifically 1995, there was a new way at the time to measure how that safe, those safety principles was, uh, were embedded in the, the organization. This was the well-known, uh, you probably would have seen this in some way or another, the, the well-known DuPont-Bradley curve, which looked at maturity levels within the organization for, for, for safety. Um, it looked at defining an organization that was basically immature or they basically reactive. They, they did things because something had happened all the way to an organization that had individuals that proactively looked after each other's. So this, uh, this journey has happened somewhere else. And again, I can hear your thoughts. It's not black magic. It's just, I'm an engineer as well. So I've had exactly the same thoughts. You're thinking, surely you can't apply the same ap approach to process safety. Process safety is much more complex than occupational safety. They are completely different, total nonsense. You cannot use the same, um, same thinking. Well, let's have a look at that. Let's have a look at that. We've, uh, we've done some work on, on this and um, we used this to do the second part of this uh, presentation, which is the, the case study that we're gonna talk about. We, using the same thinking, so applying the same thinking, but encompassing wider uh, concepts like risk, change management, leadership, performance, culture, um, and threading major accident topics uh, through each relevant aspect, we started redesigning the, the way we looked at um, process safety uh, management. And whilst the DuPont Bradley tended to focus on an individual worker's view of the world around them, so they wanted to develop an individual perspective of care towards others, so proactively look after you know the, your brother's keeper, etc. This same approach looks at doing the same but with the organization, moving from a avoidance or reactive um, approach to process safety where it's a little bit of a pain, we need to do it because the HSE keeps uh, telling us to do it, all the way to it's part of our values, it's, it is who we are 
process safety is who we are. It defines the organization. Regardless of what the organization is, it's part and parcel of how that organization exists. Um, and we're looking at um, continuous learning from both leaders and um, the, the operational teams. Effective governance, that's fingerprinted to the organization and is well understood. Um, change management is not just about the big bang changes, it's actually looking at the little creep um, of unknown or poorly understood changes and actually puts a lot of attention on understanding how those little nudges affect um, the business as a whole. Um, people are um, comfortable, empowered to actually discuss and challenge how they're doing things and they have the skills and the tools to continue that evolution process, not just to apply it, but actually to challenge it and modify it. And that model raises a, a whole new dimension of how to look at process safety management and we call it organizational process safety. But ultimately what it's trying to do is look at the picture as a whole using the individual aspects of it um, that contribute to it to diagnose the level of maturity of, a, of an organization. So how does it work very, very briefly? Well, um, we use the CCPS model, um, we group a number of aspects. Um, it is a repeatable process. Uh, it looks at technical, cultural and organizational factors. Um, it looks at maturity rather than compliance with standards. Compliance standards is just one piece of it. It looks at benchmarking. It looks at um, how you actually use the information to make decisions on day to day and at board level and every, everywhere in between. Um, and it actually allows comparison um, between sides, between different organizational and geographical areas. Um, using that model, we basically thread through, we use a, a digital platform and we thread each topic through. And you can see there, for example, on the capability side, compliance with standards, we assign the, the level um, we perceive the organization to be. So in that case, compliance with standards is showing as a priority. What that means is, if you remember the model, priority sits on, we're driving compliance. It's not a value of the organization. We're still driving compliance, still looking at, we need to comply with this. Um, it's, a, it's a requirement and we understand that it's important, but it's still compliance driven rather than embedded in the organization in a um, integral way of what the business is. As a, as a digital tool obviously unlocks a lot of things um, including big data and AI to extract intelligence from it. But the, the key thing of this approach is it gives us a true finger in the pulse type of uh, view of what's happening because it's not just based on a snapshot of this is what's happening right now on this topic within this context. The potential obviously from that is to understand how it's affecting other things and to define, to define actions, um, metrics that are relevant to the organization and allows us to articulate better discussions, to talk about things like risk appetite of an organization without feeling that we're trying to shift the focus for unknown reasons or maybe not, um, not the reasons we'd hope um, an organization would use to shift that risk appetite. And one of the things that is clear from this is that we will never fully know what um, what the level of maturity is because that's ever changing, but we will better understand it. 
and we will better diagnose some of the symptoms that could um, result in a major accident um, hazard. So we've covered a little bit of the, the, the framework and the concept and the idea moving away from typical auditing, typical uh, benchmarking with technical standards towards a more um, holistic maturity level um, assessment to establish would an organization be able to claim that process safety is part of their DNA as you sometimes hear here in, in some discussions, and what does that mean? So let's use a case study. Um, so we wanted to set uh, the scene by using a, a significant major accident scenario to, to ask the question, would this approach that we've just described have helped prevent that major accident? And what better scenario than the reactor for a Chernobyl uh, catastrophe that we were all familiar and has its anniversary today? 36th anniversary and is still resonating. It, its impact and its learnings are still resonating throughout. Um, so a perfect fit for, for our discussion today. A perfect fit because it will allow us to, without getting too hung up on the, the technical aspects of um, what happened on the day, it should allow us to use it as a bit of an acid test to see would this shine shine the light on the more holistic issues, the, 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 the actual broader impact of those individual practices or um, um, gu lack of guidance, etc. Um, and the impact it had on other aspects to lead to where we ended up with. Um, obviously, we, we all have a bias now on what happened and why it happened. We've we've read, seen, observed um, documentaries, even a fiction series based on uh, the real events. However, even with that, we tried to, to strip out to, to basic facts as much as we could based on the information available. It's going to be high level. There's a lot to cover on the Chernobyl incident, but it, I hope it just gives you a, a view of how it could have been um, impacted by a more effective PSM approach. So a very, very um, simplified diagram of what the generation scheme was at reactor four, which is pretty much a typical scheme for a, a nuclear reactor. We have obviously the, the nuclear core, we have the water being heated to generate steam, which then drives a turbine generator. Um, nothing particularly revolutionary about it. There's loads of uh, similar plants. It is important to to highlight that um, they have the the company that operated this system had um, issues with another uh, power station using similar technology in the upcoming months to the catastrophe, and some of that learning wasn't translated into action. Um, One point that is important to make, despite be, this being a fairly standard um, scheme for generation, is as engineers and um, um, chemists, chemical engineers, uh, consultants, operators, managers, it's important to recognize that um, with regards to this scenario, we're dealing with a very complex reaction and that uh, equation you're seeing, it's truly oversimplified. There's a hell of a lot going on, especially when we consider the runaway nat nature of it. And the potential for the energy release is significantly higher than anything we'd see on a chemical or petrochemical or oil and gas plant by multiple orders of magnitude. Okay, so it is representative of maybe some of the things that we saw as we reviewed this this case study with regards to um, understanding the level of risk they were actually managing. 
and the potential um, that ended up resulting in the catastrophe we're, for, we're familiar with. Um, also noteworthy is the, the speed that the runaway reaction develops in, uh, in nuclear applications. Um, I believe it was, um, it was at a 30 megawatt um, power plant. And when the, the reaction started, the, the runaway reaction started, um, it went from that capacity to tens of gigawatts in a matter of seconds. Um, so not only the energy release is much higher, it happens very, very quickly. And I think it's important to keep this as a picture of risk that was being managed uh, during the operation of that plant. So this is not comparable to the typical uh, oil and gas, petrochem and chemical industries runaway scenarios, but it has the same risk enablers. The principles are pretty much similar. Um, and because of that, we feel we can extrapolate some of the learnings to um, to apply more broadly than just the, the nuclear um, industry. Okay, so what did we do? Well, we basically took the information we had and took took it through that assessment using that model. We looked at each one of the um, areas in, defined in the CCPS guidance. We overlaid our um, maturity model based on with the inf uh, information we had. And in the right hand side of that slide, you can see that each one of those um, was scored with regards to where we felt the evidence was showing us the um, um, the organization was operating. And it's quite telling that um, there isn't a higher value in that score than um, a compliance driven uh, process safety management element. Uh, quite a few of them are in the compliance, so they, they um, have the systems, they, they audit, they there's a reporting system for abnormal conditions and concerns, there's a, a level of accountability, but it's still looking at complying with something. And there's a number of areas that are quite low rated, they're almost at um, the burden, well some of them are at the burden, and some of them are at the necessity stage, which is we know we need to do this, we don't really want to, but we kind of need to. It's a, um, it's basically a, a, a something that with if we don't do, we're going to have some repercussions rather than understanding what what is actually the the risk. And those items were process safety man process knowledge man management, um, incident investigation. As I said, there was incidents that were available to the team that weren't explored in learnings extracted. Uh, hazard identification and risk analysis was not um, present as it should be for that type of scheme. Operating procedures, there was issues with that. Um, and conduct of operations in discipline was pretty low. Process safety culture and workforce involvement was very low. So there's a lot of data and a lot of detail behind this, but this starts painting a picture really. Um, when your best performing areas are only at compliance level, but your worst performing areas are all to do with how your people understand and act um, with regards to process safety aspects, it starts giving you some, some food for thought. And on the next slide, we've summarized um, some of the findings. Now, there's a lot on this going on on this slide, but let me just take you through a few things. Um, some of the stuff is fairly standard, as you expect. We we're, we're going to find some of the stuff that they found um, in the the multiple research and the investigation um, cases that we we've delved into, like uh, cultural issues. 
um, uh, tolerating substandard performance, process safety culture. Uh, the organization was pretty low, but there was some things that caught my mind and uh, the, our team's attention quite uh, quite a lot. Um, enabling decision makers with adequate awareness of risks and a sense of vulnerability. Genuinely, there was um, enough information to e extract from the, the investigations to tell us that some of the decision makers, the level of pressure and um, context that they were dealing every day diluted that that vulnerability uh, feeling we should have an operating with high risk plants and they truly didn't understand the potential for, for the catastrophe that ended up happening. Um, the balance of risk appetite, um, the leadership team is probably more keen on driving things closer to the bone, the operational team maybe not so much. And when you have a decision making group that doesn't understand the potential and is driving a number of actions under high um, stress conditions, then you start having problems. Um, there was issues with regards to being able to actually just say this is not right. Um, I'm not um, not carrying on operation or I'm not carrying on the work that we're doing. Um, there was also issues with underpinning information that could have allowed people to take different actions or understand what was going on uh, earlier on, including the knowledge of the organization and how to deal with abnormal, abnormal conditions. So there was a number of things that in isolation might not seem that unusual to um, when you do an audit on a legacy plant um, that's been evolving with um, the, the, the operational profile and the regulatory profile of that place. But actually, when you look at it as a maturity level, how capable is this organization to make decisions when dealing with a high risk application, alarm bells start ringing. Using the maturity-based approach allowed us to have those kind of connecting tunnels between the main tunnels and to start challenging, could have this uh, impacted that bit or did they all come together to generate that very famous hole in the Swiss cheese? So the conclusions we, we took out of this were, um, we, we used that methodology, maturity-based uh, methodology in our digital tool to look at the case study. And we were able to go past the, the documented evidence. We were able to ask, start asking questions that linked different pieces of evidence together rather than look at what that evidence was showing us. Instead of saying, oh, the procedures weren't very good, though the procedures weren't very good specifically when they needed to help the operator to make a decision on how to deal with what was going on. And that was also undermined by their ability to respond or stop work and the culture was, so we, we went past the, this is what the paper's telling us. Um, and we started painting a picture of field practice rather than um, documented practice. Um, we started in the conversations, um, we started talking about the value um, values um, within the organization, it got there very quickly. And instead of talking about how good they were with asset integrity and the codes that they should have used and the issues with the design, we started talking about did the people involved in that event think the right way to take quick action and maintain the level of safety? Um, did the people involved in that event as it was developing up to the event, have the right level of um, not just knowledge but confidence in challenging what they thought was right to identify the signs that something could have gone terribly wrong, which eventually it did. So that is it part and parcel of how they do things or is it we're compliant so we now just need to operate um, and deal with it 
because the, the checklist has been ticked and we're okay. And we started identifying interconnecting improvement points. Um, so operational teams risk knowledge and appetite for doing certain things versus the decision makers, how that interaction comes together, the changes in accepted practices under changing conditions due to conflicting demands and requirements. So these are the little nudges that eventually get to a point and uh, expose any ability to respond. So if you have an operations team that's now um, doing um, doing a number of actions to deal with an abnormal condition, but being driven by the decision makers to continue feeding that abnormal condition and culturally not really having the, the support to say, no, this, this is not the right thing, as well as the design issues, the operational uh, asset issues that they were experiencing, it kind of snowballs. And those changes, um, those nudges were not just unmanaged, they, they, they literally became part of the runaway. There was a, a runaway uh, change in the, the, the practices, um, an escalation of those changes of two practices, but as well as the runaway that was happening in the reactor. And when you look historically, um, there had been opportunities to learn from this and actually embed some learnings. And the audits had been done, the boxes had been ticked, the actions had been raised, but nothing had been done with it. So this tool actually allowed us to, to start joining the dots to look at how mature it was. And in reality, if some of these themes had been addressed correctly, that day where uh, they had to make decisions with regards to um, producing more electricity, etc., I think the decisions would have been very different and they would have been able to deploy sp specific actions to try and um, get hold of the condition of the, 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 the reactor much earlier on and spe specifically when the, the the demand peak occurred and they had to quickly um, change their uh, operating conditions there would have been um, there would have been multiple barriers to actually allow it to get to, to where it went but again very high level there's there's a lot of a lot of data behind this that supports and challenges some of these conclusions which is exactly what this is intended to do. So in all, it could have played a, a significant role in preventing that catastrophe um, if the, the focus had been on the maturity of the organization with regards to process safety and embedding that as how the organization does things rather than we comply with things, we, we comply with the codes, we have the right procedures, now we just need to operate the asset. So yes, it, it could have um, potentially prevented the, the incident um, if there was a, a broader picture of the, the way process safety was being managed. So this kind of takes us to, to the conclusion where ultimately there was a, a number of questions I kind of threw during the presentation, but ultimately what we're trying to say uh, with, this, uh, with this webinar is process safety is a, a, an interactive complex um, organism that should be part and parcel of the broader organism that the organization is. And it should be a value that's embedded, not just talked about. It should have links to the other business processes and it should actually continuously feed, support and challenge that, uh, that organization rather than look specifically at just technical compliance, just the, the standards, uh, driven approach. So thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, there's so much more we could say about this. Um, I am going to quickly hand over to Susanna to, to take us through the, the rest of the webinar. Thank you very much and uh, uh, I'll be very keen to answer any questions you might have uh, raised. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. Uh, can you please uh, switch? To... Thank you. So yeah, 
thank you so much for this really interesting presentation. And I'm pretty sure, uh, as you said, that there were uh, there were questions. Uh, I will give the floor soon uh, to ask you those questions. In the meantime, while I'm presenting uh, our work at the iChemist Safety Center, feel free to add uh, your questions to the questions box. Uh, we have uh, a few minutes. Uh, to answer those. If we are not able to answer your questions today, then uh, I'm pretty sure that Paolo is available uh, to uh, to answer your questions later by uh, forwarding uh, emails. So Paolo also mentioned a, a lot of aspects about uh, process safety management system, especially auditing. And I'm really, really glad that he mentioned it because uh, we are currently working on a guidance document. Uh, here are the guidance documents that we have already published. You can uh, see them at uh, our website and download them because they are free of charge. And uh, we are developing now a guidance document about uh, process safety lead metrics on auditing systems, especially how to measure whether your audit system in place is effective. So I'm pretty sure that it will be a good add on to the uh, to the approach that uh, Paolo just uh, presented and uh, we shouldn't stop learning. And I'm also really glad that uh, you mentioned uh, creeping changes and uh, so that you can find that we have published uh, a lot of interactive case studies within the iChemist Safety Center and one of them actually addresses uh, creeping uh, changes. That is our latest uh, case study. Uh, which is uh, safe anyway, it is called. But uh, also you can find uh, an older version of the safety law we published on the same topic. So, and uh, our past webinars. All together with this particular webinar, uh, feel free to visit our website and gather all the information that you can from there and use those materials uh, uh, either in your trainings or uh, just forwarding uh, them to your colleagues, etc. So not to take much uh, more time of that, uh, Paolo, um, I give you back the floor to answer those uh, those questions uh, very, very quickly, if you if you wish so. Of course, yes. Um, could you just help me visualize yes. those questions? Yes. Um, Please. There, is, there are uh, comments uh, about the, the ICAMI safety and loss prevention uh, SIG that is a really valuable source of information. And then there is, a, I think it is a comment with facility under operation. These are safety critical equipment deferrals or abnormal operational situation, which an organization might have assessed as part of risk assessment but what is the practical way forward in determining cumulative risk assessment? That's, that's a really good question. And the, the use of um, the word cumulative usually fills people with dread. But in reality, our understanding of um, asset-based um, benefit or value is, is something that needs to evolve. So um, when, when we look at equipment and the role they play on the overall process safety scheme, um, they usually are bound by two things. One is the, the practices we have in place to um, keep your plant operating, whether they're safety critical or not. The, their ability to do their job is what keeps your business um, operating in a safe manner. So if everything worked as we design it, process safety wouldn't be an issue, but the equipment fails and people fail. So from an equipment point of view, to understand cumulative risk, equipment driven uh, cumulative risk, um, we need to be better at defining what role the, that equipment actually uh, plays on that overall risk. So if I give you a very, very brief example, a pump might be responsible for a particular uh, release scenario that we're, we're looking at that could re generate a fire and a, a major accident. But that pump will have an operational duty. That pump will have a number of requirements associated with keeping it operating in a safe manner, as well as the safety requirements should something happen that would uh, cause a, a loss of containment. And that broader view 
is in fact quantifying the 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 value that pump has and needs to have with as part of your overall scheme for that equipment now can you put a number onto that um it, it's not straightforward for a, a lot of equipment some equipment simpler than other there's standards out there for a, a safety critical equipment and um including ic61511 for a, a safety instrumented systems uh, however i think to bind ourselves to wanting one number that says this is the cumulative risk and that's okay is actually falling on the trap of that tunnel i was talking about a number is one part of the things we need to consider the way we then use that number the way we make decisions around that number the way we our practices take into account that number as Susanna said how creeping changes affect that number and subsequently our decision making is is the key thank you paulo uh, we have two additional questions are we having too many process safety metrics kpi and how do we focus efforts to ensure we don't end up with the dashboard uh, that you've shown absolutely great great questions the uh, the first question do we have too many process safety metrics my initial answer to that and it's a good answer it's yes uh, it's really easy to develop uh, dashboards with 20, 30 items and then find out that you only really need three or four depending on what you're looking at. So, for example, um, if you're looking at asset-based compliance to have a, I don't know, 30 item mechanical integrity dashboard it's probably not going to add much value. In fact, it might going to dilute the focus you need to have. Uh, each organization needs to, this is one of the key aspects of having a maturity um, based approach to process safety is to, each organization needs to understand where their core focus needs to be and what they need to manage to maintain an ad adequate level of risk, a tolerable level of risk, but also to be able to deploy that value driven type of approach where it's clear it's simple it's actu uh, actionable and it it becomes parts and parcel of how the organization does things overly complex metrics overly complex models do drive the um, the other behavior which is let's see if we can get as many boxes showing green as we can rather than understanding what's behind them so um, if you look at uh, HSG 254 there's a, a really good discussion on how to link uh, what things you need to look at to the representative scenarios for your major accident hazard um, sets so it should be with the focus on what you're actually trying to manage. Now, we can't ignore things like leadership, we can't ignore things like culture, we can't ignore things like how th those things interconnect, but the day-to-day -day management of process safety should be a lot simpler than sometimes it uh, it's implemented out there. Um, and to the second question, how do we get to a point where we don't have a complex dash dashboard? I think it's the same answer, uh, but it's that evolu it's that maturity. At the beginning, we'll try to monitor everything because that's what we feel we have to and be to being told that we need to. As we mature, we will re recognize that maybe certain things are already being monitored effectively and they are at a level of maturity that you can um, deprioritize, de-escalate the focus and refocus on the things that, that the improvement piece that's really gonna advance you in terms of your maturity. So for example, on the, the case study we had, they had a very, very poor uh, score on the, the, the actual um, cultural aspect. So that's probably something they wanna focus on. So let's develop the focus on that. And the other aspects that were a bit better, maybe have less of a focus and report more more detailed uh, information on the focus and more broader on the other ones it's a balance okay each organization will have its own balance to to follow but yeah it fingerprinting is key not to get to a point where you're just measuring for measuring sake i totally agree with you paulo thank you and the last question before we uh 
wrap up this uh, webinar session. Uh, and with that, uh, I would like to thank everyone who uh, participated today and attended today. And, and you also, Paolo, for the great presentation. So the last question would be, where do the maturity groups you have used originate from? They, they originate from the CCPS guidance for process safety. And again, we use the CCPS guidance because it's widely published and adopted, but the approach could use any other model. It could use the Energy Institute framework. It could look at the regulatory regime you're operating in and extract a similar type of, of model from that. The, the principle of defining maturity levels is, is the key thing here. The, the individual items, yeah, it's, uh, it's from published data from the CCPS guidance for process safety. Fantastic. I'm looking forward to, to more uh, of these uh, models to be presented for other cases. <clears throat> thank you, Paolo, and thank you, everyone. Thank you. We will uh, upload uh, the, the session, as I mentioned before, the recording, so feel free to, to come back and, and watch the webinar uh, at any time in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me and thanks everyone for, for being present. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.